Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Articulate Thursday. I'm your host, the mild mannered community development specialist, Nabil. Always happy to be joined by the ever wonderful Tanya. Tanya, how are you doing? What's going on today? I'm doing well. Um, welcome, everyone. And this is our second week of July. So the heat is on outside, and we are here to inspire you with this poetry edition this week. That's right. You know, we've spent a lot of time uh, in Articulate Thursdays. Um, and we've done paintings, we've done submissions, uh, drawings, coloring, uh, but we really haven't focused too much on poetry, right, Tanya? But, but poetry is, is very much a part of the art tradition. Um, it can inspire, it can make us reflect, it can make us cry, it can make us laugh, it can make us happy. So today we're going to spend time talking about poetry. And I figured what better way to talk about poetry than to sort of identify a theme uh, nature. Nature is all around us, Tanya. You would agree. Um, nature is beautiful. Uh, nature can also sometimes, uh, nature can be angry sometimes at us, right? A thunderstorm. Um, but nature, nature is filled with emotions. It's filled with serenity. It's filled with everything and anything, right? Um, so we, I figured today, let's just use uh, nature as a theme and look at several different types of poetry. Um, and how um, nature is used as imagery, nature is used to convey a message uh, in so many different ways. Um, so, Tanya, if you don't mind, uh, do you want to go ahead and read for us the very first poem? And I could tell a little bit about the, the artist who sort of made the poem. So this is Oneness, and I apologize if I'm butchering the name, Oneness by Robert Dadis. Dad, Dad he, uh, Sila Hall, who is an indigenous uh, artist, and this is from a collection of poetry which was published uh, in T and Bannock Stories uh, for First Nations by Simon Fraser University. So Tanya, if you would do us the honors to read it, and maybe we can share our reflections afterwards. Great. So before I read this, I do want to acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Mississaugas of the First Nation of the Credit First Nation here in Oakville. Uh, and so when we are reading this poem, let's think about the land, the land that um, we reside on now, the land uh, that was given to us by the many generations before us, and the land that we will also leave for the next seven generations, our children, our children's children, and so on really important. And um, in this session today, if you are sitting near a window, um, please look out the window, reflect on the words that we're sharing, because um, it can be quite powerful to look at a tree outside your window as we're um, reflecting on these poems. So this is oneness. Learning the salmon's language with the help of his paddle, they are close just as water controls life for them. The paddle moves me to their home and they never, sorry, and they ever fail to come back and say to me, my brother, I know your ancestors. Right, short and sweet, but there's so much in it, right, Tanya? I think uh, my reflections, if, if I may, um, I find the, this, you know, this, this poem or this poetry to be something that is so grounding, right? And it's so, when it talks about oneness, like, you know, we are learning the salmon's language, right? There, uh, which means we are sharing space with the salmon and we are not the knowledge holders, right? We are learning the language of the salmon um, and we're in their space, right? Like the paddle moves me to their home. I find that to be so beautiful, right? Because this space is not ours and we can't act like we own the land and the spaces in which we occupy, the spaces we occupy. And, and, and the very last, uh, you know, sentence is, my brother, I know your ancestors. It's, for me, when I, when I read that, it, it, it's, it's the connection that we have to the land, the connection that we have to water, to nature, to all of us collectively, right? And so this, this salmon, that might be something you might never even have thought of, you know, they know, their, they know your ancestors. They were there before you. They're going to be there after you. Um, and so to pay them the respect that they deserve, right? And, and that's sort of like a metaphor for the, the land, you know, pay the land and nature the respect that it deserves because guess what? We are 
but a tiny drop in the ocean uh, and, and nature is so much more than us, right? Any reflections for yourself, Tanya, with this point? Well, I just, you know, it, it makes me remember, well, remember in teachings that the waterways that we live near here in Oakville, the 12 mile creek, the 16 mile creek, uh, the Credit, the Humber, that these were all waterways that had salmon in them. Today, not, not so much. I know, I believe in the Humber River, they're reintroducing salmon, but these waterways were full of life. Um, and, and we have to remember what was here before us, uh, that it's not always just about us in this time, but what came before us and what we will leave after. Uh, and also thinking about like learning the salmon's language, salmon often swim upstream. So against the current. And if you are paddling or if you've ever paddled in a canoe, or a kayak that if you are going against the current, sometimes it's really hard depending on uh, the waterway that you're on. And so it's just just like life. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can be smooth sailing and easy, and other times you do have to um, work against the current. Right, absolutely awesome. Thank you for that, Tanya. All right, let's move on to our next poetry. Um, we have Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. Um, and I do not pretend to be a poetry aficionado, um, but from my readings of Mary Oliver, um, you know, she is uh, revered as one of the uh, greatest uh, poetry artists that incorporate uh, nature in many of her work. Um, so I'll read this for you um, and I'll try my best to do it the justice that it deserves. So here's Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animals of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Any reflections, Tanya? Well, this was very um, contemplative and uh, maybe a little sad in some moments, um, but also remembering that we are part of a larger organism. So much is going on um, and that, you know, no one is too small to be important as well. Um, and, and I really like the uh, range of um, elements that she introduced. So thinking about animals, to the sky, to, um, you know, different things that are happening throughout even just a moment or a day in a passage. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tanya. And what I find interesting is the poem starts itself off by, you know, placing oneself in, in, in perhaps a state of despair where they're looking for some level of atonement or repentance. Um, so in a state of despair, you tend to sometimes lose yourself, right? Like there's, not a, there's nothing to ground you into something. And then the second part of the poem sort of talks about how while you're experiencing this distress, you know, nature is still happening in, in so many beautiful ways. And, and sometimes you have to be like the wild geese. And I don't know if the wild geese is, if, is there anything like the Canadian geese, right? Um, but, uh, but sometimes they can be harsh, right? And sometimes they can be majestic. Uh, um, but, but the idea is that nature can be grounded, right? So no matter what the distress sometimes we experience in life, to know that nature is, is as is, right? And if you can ground yourself in nature, 
perhaps you can get a better perspective on the challenges that you might be experiencing in your personal life, right? And so, and you can find the, your place in the family of things, right? Because your distress has a space in the context of nature, in the context of life, right? So interesting. Uh, the next one, I love this next poetry because it's a haiku. Um, and, and I know a haiku, um, there's some controversy. I'm not sure, is it five, seven, five syllables or five? maybe there's different ways of, of doing it uh, or, or I think 17 syllables in total. Um, so maybe you guys can comment below and let us know exactly uh, how many syllables and in each line what the syllables are if there's different um, different uh, versions of, of different types of haiku. But uh, but this is this haiku is actually by uh, Matsuo Basho uh, who is uh, regarded as one of the greatest uh, haiku artists from Japan. Um, and so, Tanya, would you do us the honors of, of uh, reading this haiku for us? Great, yes. Um, yeah, and so what I remember is it has to do with the amount of syllables in each line. So whether it's like five, seven, five, it's a, there is a formula That's right. um, to its structure and it's very minimal. So compared to the other two poems that we have just read that are long and fluid, um, this is very, could be considered short, but I would say it's, it's minimal. Um, and, you, and you do have to reflect on the choice of the language, right? So um, this, is, this is the haiku. When you say something, the lip feel cold, the autumn wind. So it's quite interesting. So when you say something, the lip feel cold, your lips feel cold, and then the autumn wind. So it's almost thinking about the change in seasons. What is it that touches you, that reminds you that autumn is coming? Um, so it's quite lovely. Right. I, I, the reason, Tanya, that I love this poem is because you mentioned it, it, it's minimalistic, but at the same time, that it requires the reader, you know, to engage with this, with their own creativity, with their own imagery, with their own uh, reflections, right? And so when I read this, right, like when you say something, uh, the lip feel cold. Uh, how often does that happen, right? Uh, and then it gives you the example, right? It's the autumn wind, right? And so we all know of the summer breeze that feels so nice when you're on a hot day, right? But the autumn wind, you know, if you're not wearing a uh, fall jacket and, you know, the wind kind of blows or breezes by you, like you feel it, right? And you feel sometimes the chill of the wind, uh, the same way sometimes you feel the chill of the words that we sometimes speak, right? And so this, reading this just allows me to be a little bit more conscious of you know, words are powerful. Words can convey uh, very positive messages, but at the same time, words can also do the opposite, right? It can convey a lot of negativity and a lot of um, a lot of harsh things, right? And so, let us not be like the autumn wind uh, that you know makes us feel that chill. Let us be much more cognizant of the things that we say. Um, so, in those like short, short syllables. Um, you know, I was able to reflect that from it. So, so wonderful. We will read one more uh, poem. Um, so this is uh, called The Park by the Sonnet Man. And what I will do is I will leave the links to all these poetries and all their websites um, below. Um, and I think this is perfect because, you know, Tanya and I work for Parks and uh, Recreation, uh, sorry, Recreation and Culture um, and Parks have a space in, in the job that we do. Uh, so it was just really nice for me to find a poetry that speaks to uh, the importance of park. So um, I will read it and then and, and we can share uh, some of our reflections. So here we go. I do rely on the park for my soul to give it sustenance and restfulness. Natural, the perspective as a whole can escape here the worldly dreadfulness. The green of the grass, the plants and the trees is soothing beauty when it when it when in its presence. The silver gray green waters also please. In spirit, mellifluous in essence. The ducks swim or repose around the edge. 
other birds which can float or fly to show, while whilst tweet songs land based bird from branch to hedge, boldly heard, yes, the parks, the place to go. It is for me an oasis of calm on a world weary soul. It is like balm. So this is a sonnet, of course, Tanya, and I know you know, sonnets are, um, I believe there are 14 lines in total, uh, alternating in, in, I guess, uh, pairs of four uh, with the final two uh, lines there. Um, and so this is obviously a sonnet, another version of the poem. Uh, any reflections that comes to mind? Well, I think um, during the past couple of months of the pandemic, uh, many people have been going out for walks uh, through parks. Uh, there was a while when we couldn't um, really hang out in parks in the sense of like sitting and uh, having picnics and whatnot. Um, but just the, uh, the experience of being in nature, I think has been very important for people. I know for myself, it was an important part of my day when I was in isolation to be able to um, take a walk if I was able, um, but also looking out a window. So I have a great big tree in my backyard and uh, I had moved my desk so that I could look out the window and watch the tree change from its, you know, leafless branches in March and April to budding um, leaves to now a full on beautiful summer tree that moves in the wind and uh, provide shade and nesting homes for squirrels. Um, so I think nature and being in a park, having access to park spaces is really important for many people. Um, so it was just really lovely to listen to you read the sonnet and imagine um, all the activity that, that happens in a park. Great. And I think how appropriate, right, Tanya, that this, this poem speaks to the importance of calm when everything was closed, right? When I remember uh, when we were sort of, you know, knee deep in, in you know, physical distancing um, and the parks opened up or, or, or the walks you would go through, like, the park provided that space for calm and peace in an otherwise uncertain, um, scary world, right? Not too long ago, right? Some of us are experiencing uh, it currently as we speak. So, so you know, to this poem uh, is that you know, the park, which can be in the middle of a very urban neighborhood, in the middle of a very busy street, uh, or in and around you know, a very busy area, that place is still calm, right? Like you can be literally in the middle of like lots of things happening and you walk into a park, whether it's passive or active park, you can find that peace, right? You can find that element that sort of makes you feel calm again, right? And so, and I like the last line, right? It's like a bomb, right? So it's almost like it's a, um, it's a very soothing, uh, therapeutic, almost like a, uh, uh, like a, not a band-aid, but something that can soothe you while you, uh, deal with all the interesting things that life has to, to sort of share or send your way. Wonderful. So the last poetry or, or poetry art form I wanted to share with you, which is quite popular in, in today's age, is, is spoken word, right? Um, I'm sure you've YouTubed uh, some awesome spoken word. So one of the things I wanted to share is this wonderful poetry. And maybe, um, again, technology doesn't always work. So I'm hoping the sound, and Tanya, maybe you can let me know if the sound and the audio, you can hear it. Um, and if it's not lagging, because uh, if it is, then maybe I can uh, directly go to the YouTube link and, and play it. So this is called Man uh, versus Earth, uh, and it's by Prince uh, EA, who is a motivational speaker and also an activist. Um, I was thoroughly entertained, thoroughly inspired, and thoroughly uh, you, you know, you, I, re, I reflected tons after listening and watching this, uh, this artwork. So Tanya, are you ready for this? I am. Alrighty. So you let me know if it's playing properly on your end, okay? Fun fact, planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for 
Drum roll, please. Three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves Homo sapiens, meaning wise man. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not too smart for your own good. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes. But at the same time, those atoms we split created nuclear warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rejects and neglects the home that we have here now. So no, that cannot be wisdom. Wisdom is different. While intelligence speaks, wisdom listens, and we willingly covered our ears to Mother Nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help-wanted signs. Wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, so if we were wise, we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before, or more drought, hurricanes, and wildfire than ever before, because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we have increased the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal rate. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lion gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone in three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us will be gone because of us in this three seconds. In an existence shorter than a Vine video, we turn the circle of life into our own personal conveyor belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet in this solar system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, we are one in a billion, trillion, trillion. That's a one followed by 33 zeros. And I don't want to get too spiritual, but how are we not a miracle? We are perfectly positioned to the sun so we don't burn, but not too distant so we don't turn to ice. Goldilocks said it best, we are just right. This paradise where we are given medicine from trees, not coincidentally, but because like the song says, we are family, literally everything, every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish. And this is what we must recognize before it's too late because the real crisis is not global warming, environmental destruction, or animal agriculture, it is us. These problems are symptoms of us, byproducts of us. Our inner reflection, loss of connection has created this misdirection. We have forgotten that everything contributes to the perfection of Mother Nature. Corporations keep us unaware and disconnected, but they have underestimated our strength. Contrary to popular belief, millions are waking up out of their sleep, seeing our home being taken right up under our feet. We cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked, greedy, and loony. It is our duty to protect Mother Nature from those who refuse to see her beauty. Call me crazy, but I believe we should have the right to eat food that's safe with ingredients we can pronounce. Drink water that is clean, marvel at trees, breathe air free of toxins. These are natural rights, not things that can be bargained for in Congress. See, they want you to feel powerless, but it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world. Well, when enough people come together, we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection, freedom for all without oppression. But it is up to you, yes, you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and only together can we make it to the fourth second. All right, Tanya. What'd you think? That, that was powerful and the imagery as well. Um, I was engaged throughout the entire um, four minutes of that of that performance. That was amazing. That was a great choice, Nabil. And I think it's also um, a really lovely um, ending to the first poem that was yes. presented that reflects back to the salmon. Uh, so I kept going back and reflecting on all the poems today and how, you know, it's another universal teaching and how everything goes back to nature and who we are based on nature. And I couldn't help to also think about the future and how I'm constantly in awe of the youth in our society who have taken positions to um, not only be activists, but take on campaigns, no matter, you know, how small they might be as a person. Um, so, you know, we think of Greta Thun Thunberg, 
uh, who was the Swedish, who is the Swedish environmental activist, a, a young woman who um, is just very straightforward in her um, speaking and uh, and what she wants to address regarding her position in the climate and how people have been listening. So I think um, there's something that there's hope there for me. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Tanya. And again, I, I, I completely agree with you that um, the connection that this uh, spoken word piece has to the first poem about oneness, right? It, uh, it starts off with somebody just, you know, paddling through a river. Um, but in perspective of that, um, you know, humankind or, or you know, our, our humanity can be something that pushes us forward in, in, in alliance with the land and with, with nature. But at the same time, you know, three seconds of our existence, what does the fourth second look like, right? Like how have we made the next second and how are we gonna make the seconds after that? Um, really puts things into perspective that we have a huge role to play in the preservation of nature uh, and nature has an immense role to play as we have, sometimes we get humbled by nature in, in our own preservation, right? Um, so we have to do our part. Um, we have to make sure that we're conscious of, of that. And I, I love this, the passion in this, in the spoken word, the imagery, the, even the background music and the words, obviously, right? Like all of it kind of just flows so well to, to hold us accountable for our actions and to know that, you know, mother nature is, is bigger than us. And, and sometimes it will remind us and, and also let us be accountable to what the next second for us and, and everything around us is going to be. So that's our show, guys. Um, I have one more slide. Uh, oops. So if you have an idea, for the next Articulate Thursday, um, please email public.art at oakville.ca with your suggestions. We're always looking at ways for it to be more creative. If you were inspired by some of the poetry and nature as a theme, we would love it if you were to share some of your, your uh, poetry, poems, spoken word, you know, or just your thoughts. Um, share it with us. We'll be happy to, to, to give you a shout out at our next, uh, next Articulate Thursday, but, but any, Parting thoughts, Tanya. Well, I hope again, as Nabil mentioned, that um, this segment did inspire you to um, reflect on uh, the next walk that you take, or if you're working in your garden today, um, on nature and what it what it gives to us, um, and what we will um, do to it to keep. Um, to keep it existing for for our family and, and generations to come. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you, everybody, for watching. This is Articulate Thursday. Until next time, take care, everybody. Stay safe. Peace out, Oakville.